wing. Your turn. So, your turn. You are on. You are on air. Okay. Ah, this example la dari ngacira tinggal kamu nale cuma tu miki. Lub da kad sunda lagi lubi da lub tu su dalam da dia awi bi lekum nale doktor karma gigi utsi migi gopen kara lo cuma leso si suge la nara gigi ming bawajin rinchen sela bi la tengah na ngaci kutsab gigi ikhlas nalo ingkin na bawajin ngaci na gigi embesi nalo cha su do si su dibe la so tadi nale malu tato ngaci nalo ro cigi gigi mi le saya beli tendi ngaci nale malu ingkin na bepi gigi la. So it's a warm welcome from all of us here at CMS today, and it's particularly exciting for all of us to be hosting this virtual visit by Bhutanese students. And I believe that this is the first ever such visit from Bhutan at CMS and CERN. And uh, this, I would say, is a historical moment for all of us. And uh, I would like to say that you all are the first batch of Bhutanese visiting CMS and CERN, and for which I'm particularly excited. And I do hope that today's event, which is of the very first beginning, would uh, really uh, start on a new chapter for Bhutan and would help spark interest for particle physics uh, uh, and STEM education among the students in Bhutan. And uh, I would really like to encourage all the schools and students, teachers, as well as officials to actively participate in today's session. And with this, without further ado, I think I will hand over to Dr. Karma in Bhutan, who really is the main uh, uh, organizer. And before I hand over to Dr. Karma, I would also like to thank Mr. Michael, Dr. Archana, and all the team from CERN who have made this visit possible. So thank you to all of you for making this possible. Mm -hmm. And I hand over to you, Dr. Karmala. Uh, thank you, La. Uh... Next, uh, we have a small address uh, from the director of the Royal Society for STEM, uh, Mr. Karma Ondin. Very good uh, morning and very good so we lost them oh, we lost the lost we lost the voice uh you are muted you are muted sorry can you hear me yes now we hear you again yes okay morning and a very good afternoon Us. Grateful for the opportunity to say a few words ahead of this very exciting and anticipated uh, event. On behalf of the Royal Society for Science, Technology, Engineering and Mathematics, an office under His Majesty's Secretariat, and all of us participating from Bhutan, I'd like to extend our warmest greetings to the scientists, and team led by Michael at the European Organization for Nuclear Research, or CERN, at Geneva, Switzerland. We're extremely delighted to have the opportunity to participate in a live virtual tour of CMS, Compact Moon Solenoid Facility at CERN, and also to interact with some of the best scientists in the world. So from all of us, on behalf of all of us participating from Bhutan, I'd like to express our deepest appreciation and gratitude for this precious opportunity. I'd also like to extend a special welcome and greetings to all our students and teachers participating today. They are our main target participants. We are told that about 140 schools from across the country with about 10,000 students are participating in this event. 
we are very happy that so many students of our students are able to join us today. I have no doubt that our students will find this event very inspiring and interesting. Uh, I'm also confident that today's event will further strengthen their existing passion and motivation for science and technology, and also help them discover new ones. His Majesty, the King's vision for the country is for us to become a fully developed country during our lifetime and with knowledge-based and tech-driven economy. So underlining the importance of science, technology, and innovation. Bhutan will require a lot of highly educated, talented, and skilled STEM professionals in diverse fields. And actually the demand has already started and is picking up. Our students will have the opportunity as well as the responsibility to fulfill this requirement. And so today, this event will go a long way in supporting His Majesty's vision by promoting STEM in the country. I hope that CERN will continue to support us and enable us to reach to more of our students and the wider STEM community with this kind of opportunity. So with these few words, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, the permanent, Bhutan's permanent mission, mission in Cuba, Switzerland, and our Ministry of Education for their support in making <coughs> this possible for us. And last but not least, I'd like to once again extend a very big thank you to the scientists and the team at CERN in Geneva. Thank you so much. Well, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Mr. Director. Um, I, I would like to introduce now here at CERN, my, my name is Michael Ho. I'm uh, a long-term friend of the Bhutanese uh, society and people here in, uh, based in Geneva. And I, uh, I, would, I will guide you with my dear friend and colleague, Noemi Benny, downstairs um, to the, to the um, experiment. 100 meters below ground. Um, my friend uh, Sultan um, is uh, running the technical uh, team here and uh, has everything in a, is a uh, director of the visual and the audio. And then uh, I would like to introduce as well Dr. Wolfgang Adam and Dr. Ashana Schamer. Uh, from also, uh, Wolfgang is from Austria as well, um, a part of the Austrian uh, Putin Society. Uh, Friendship Society, and uh, Dr. Sharma is a responsible person for the South East uh, Asia uh, region at CERN, and she will uh, uh, part participate and give you uh, an introduction first, and while she starts the, the introduction, we will already uh, show you some visuals from uh, the surface, and then we go underground. Dr. Sharma, please come forward and... Thank you. Uh, and Thank you very much. Um, maybe one thing what I would like to emphasize still, uh, you are always welcome to ask questions. Please type them in the, in the chat. Uh, we have some moderators, local moderators. They will ask uh, our uh, local team here um, and uh, we'll, we're happy to, to under, uh, answer your questions already while the visit and after the visit when, uh, when I come up again, <clears throat> uh, we will have a question answer session where we have a, a extended discussion in addition. So please, don't hesitate to, uh, to ask questions. Thank you. Hello, can you everyone hear me? Hello? Yes, yes, we hear you. Very sure. good. So a uh, big, very warm welcome to CERN uh, with the whole team here, as you have just been introduced. We are more than excited to have you all with us, particularly the students, the teachers from Bhutan, I personally come from India, so we are friends and we are uh, working together, in fact, to make a very big impact for STEM in the region. 
and that's where uh, CERN, of course, has been uh, working a lot. We have had uh, a teacher's training program in uh, New Delhi uh, in 2019, where four Bhutanese teachers came and who had uh, been there. So the dialogue has started and now we really want to take it to the next level. And with that, I would like to just begin a little bit of an introduction of what exactly do we do here at CERN, uh, really for the students, for the teachers, and please feel free to ask questions. It's really a journey that you are going to take with us. And uh, uh, in this next hour or so, we will try to uh, share with you the excitement of what we do here. Uh, my colleague uh, Wolfgang also, he's uh, a very senior particle physicist as well, and he is also available here for all the questions and, and things that will come. So yes, uh, I, I hope that this is the right way it is written. Uh, I can go no, further. No. Ah, it's here. Next one. Yeah. So what do we do at CERN? At CERN, we do a lot of things. You have, you all students, you walk into uh, an airport, or you go to the hospital, or you go to, uh, you know, the in your in your own home, for example, when you're watching the television, or even the possibility of us having this talk today is coming from technology, from the scientific research. In fact, the WWW, by which we have been in contact, was actually created at CERN to share knowledge, to share data. And that happened with the scientists that were doing scientific research. So scientific research is extremely important as was also outlined by your director that uh, if there is no scientific research, human beings do not make progress, countries do not make progress. And of course, while we are answering questions about the universe, that's what we do in the scientific research. So we need to develop tools to do research. And those tools are really at the cutting edge of technology that we will be doing here at CERN and have been doing in the past. And by, by showing them to you, there opens a, a box or a possibility where you can participate as well, even as students and as teachers into what we do, creating the social impact and creating the engagement with not only the society, but also with industries, with businesses and software and so on. I mean, the next two decades in front of us are very challenging, particularly with the pandemic. Now we know that, you know, without science, nothing happens. And we have been able to cope with the pandemic simply because we were ready with the infrastructure and with the competence that we could address these issues. And therefore, it's extremely important to, to really be very curious. And what I would like to, uh, to really drive home here is that being curious, asking questions is most important. And at CERN, that's exactly what we do. And in CMS, you will see further as the team goes downstairs and we will show you the visuals, how we do it. So we have, of course, many, many uh, different experiments. And here we are in one of those experiments. And you have seen this, the work we do at CERN is really possible only with international collaboration. So sitting alone in a corner is not the best thing to do, right? At CERN, we do, very advanced physics. You have heard about the Higgs boson, sometimes called the God particle in our part of the world. And uh, the Large Hadron Collider is the big, uh, uh, is the big um, uh, experimental machine, the largest on the planet, in fact, the big accelerator, which collides particles. And at various points, there are interactions. And CMS is one of the places where protons are made to collide and we study the collisions that happen there and so on. Let's, let's go further. So yes, we have to look at what are the, uh, the open questions. Yes, there are just like you got, you learned in your classes about gravity, right? You learned about relativity and it's because of these things that we learned, we have got so much in our lives because we ask these questions, right? Now we want to understand further what exactly happened 
and how uh, the whole universe was created, right? These are the kind of questions you want to ask. So, um, and that by asking these questions, we have understood that we all together, you know, we have been together at some point in time, and that was about 14 billion years ago, 13.8 uh, billion years ago, we were all together in a soup. And that soup, we have to understand what exactly was it made of, right? From those soup came particles after some time. There's, of course, a, a state of matter was not known at that time, which is called quark gluon plasma. And there are studies that we do at CERN in understanding the first few minutes after the Big Bang. So we are creating this soup. And how can we do that? Let's see. We are going to collide. These are not particles. These are helicopters made out of Lego. But suppose we give them a lot of energy and if they collide, they will be broken into different pieces. That's how you know that these helicopters are made out of Lego. And we know that the fundamental building block is one piece of the Lego, right? And in this case, they are all the same. But if we suppose uh, we increase the energy to a point where everything disappears and they, uh, they do not make the Lego pieces, but something else comes out of that. For example, if something else is coming out, then we do not know. So that's how we try to recreate the, the, the conditions of the Big Bang and we study uh, what happened at the early part of the universe. Okay, so let's go. I think we have, you want to see something? Can go back? Okay, so you have studied, I'm sure the students are who are studying science, they know about the fundamental building blocks of matter. And these fundamental building blocks, um, as you know, they are crystals, atoms, and in, inside the atom, you have the nucleus. And in the inside the nucleus also, you have particles like the protons and the neutrons, who themselves are made out of particles like the quarks. And these are really the building blocks. What does it mean? That we are able to build just like the Lego helicopters, we are able to build atoms because now we have the building blocks like the up quark, down quark, and leptons like the electron. Putting them together, you will be able to make atoms. But of course, now you will say, what is the use of studying so much of all this? But imagine by, by the theory and the experiments, we were able to then use all the techniques that have been created as a spin-off from particle physics, from quantum mechanics and so on, we have been able to study uh, and make equipment like the scanning transmission electron microscope. And now we also have the cryo electron microscope, which can give you much better resolutions to study the COVID-19 um, uh, virus. So these are all things that we need and the, these maps of the viruses, then they open the doors for vaccines. And that's how we were ready. Imagine at such a scale on the planet, we were ready to go with vaccines in a record time. Usually it takes 10 years to make a vaccine, five years. And here in, in some months we were ready and we, were, we could go ahead, right? Okay, so more questions. I'm sure in the chat, there are many questions about black holes, about dark matter and so on. So we will come to those questions. Wolfgang, would you like to add something here? No, just, uh, I think we will discuss. We have All we right. time to discuss. <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Yeah, okay. So now coming back to our helicopters, we increase the energy to such an extent that, do we have that slide here? No, we don't have it because it's a PDF. Mm -hmm. No problem, but we increase the energy like at uh, the uh, like at CERN and inside the the collider at CERN we increase the energy to such a point where the Legos disappeared and if you see just behind you can see some uh, uh, something like little dinosaurs there right now do you believe in dinosaurs. Do you uh, believe these are scientific facts? Yes. <laughs> yes, because you have seen you have seen the footprints, you have seen the skeletons, you have seen uh, you know the remains or the signatures. 
So similarly, when we, when we collide the protons in our colliders, we generate in a very tiny space, the temperatures that existed at the time of the Big Bang. So we can create particles that do not exist anymore. Just like the dinosaurs, they do not exist anymore, but you know that they were there because you have seen the signatures. In the same way, we would see the signatures of particles, which tell us that they existed or may have existed at the time of the Big Bang. And we try to put them together in theories and we try to understand further. And you see this little picture here, which tells you that we can get some particles which are highly expected because we have studied the theories and we know what could be coming out. Some of them are hypothetical. You know, until the time the Higgs was discovered at CERN, in 2012, we, it was a theory. We did, not, we did not know that it's really true. Experimentalists like us at CERN and at CMS and in the other experiment called ATLAS, we were really looking for the Higgs and we found it, you know. But then we might also find other things. We might find unsuspected particles or extinct particles, you know which we know that existed, but do not exist. So I hope that the kids are having a good time looking at this and then also imagining somehow, how do we do this research, which looks a bit funny, but then it's very, very serious, of course. So this research that we do here requires number of things. And here you can see that what we need, we need accelerators, we need detectors, we need computing, and of course, we need a very big collaboration. And one of the collaboration is called CMS. That's where we are here, compact muon solenoid. And we are going to go downstairs to see this experiment. Yeah, we, we stop here for the moment. Okay. okay. Yeah. Then when there are questions, we can go further after that. Exactly. Okay? Uh, mm -hmm. Just a technical remark. Mm -hmm. uh, instead of raising your hands, could you please use the Q&A for asking questions? And, and Type in the question and type the questions. Right. Thank you. Oh, should we start? Can we with... start? Oh, yes, we need Where to start. Where is the Q and A? Let's okay. start with on the on the, uh, on the control room. Yeah, use. Yeah, maybe you show around the control yes. room yeah. here, and then we can uh, try to. Okay. So, uh, do you? Uh, Sultan, do you hear me? Yes. Of Am course. I on? I'm on air. So. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Ajana. She, uh, Ajana and, my, and Wolfgang will uh, answer your questions while we do uh, the visit here. I will start here at the steering wheel of CMS. As you heard, uh, the, the biggest microscope worldwide that you, mankind had ever built here at uh, CERN, the LHC, with the experiments. Um, and one of them is this, uh, the camera is CMS. So, and what, where uh, we are now, um, uh, broadcasting is at the steering wheel. So this is a control room um, of the experiment. The experiment down uh, is 100 meters below ground. We will go down in a minute. And uh, where I'm here, uh, you see in the background many screens. <clears throat> so, and all this, uh, this huge apparatus uh, downstairs is uh, remotely controlled, of course. Uh, right now we are in the, in the setup and the, um, uh, preparation and uh, service period. So my, my uh, colleagues are not uh, present here right now, but uh, technical work is, is, is downstairs. So what, what is, what is uh, this uh, on the, the shifters who run, who work here are <clears throat> uh, the technical shifters controlling uh, the technical equipment. And of course, uh, uh, a shifter who is the uh, communication line. So, Ooh, Mika, see... Mika, yes. just sorry for cutting in. We got a question in Q and A. Yes, please. And we would like to answer. The question was: Is it really true when two protons collide, they produce higher temperature than than in than the, the sun? sun? Yes. Yes. Uh, well, Definitely. maybe maybe this is uh, the, the, these questions. Uh, please, is Wolfgang and, and uh, Ashana can ch jump in. Yeah. Well, but let, let me let me, uh, let me first before uh, you answer the question. Maybe uh, we'll walk over and uh, uh, outside uh, from the control room because there is an, an, an interesting collage I'd like to uh, I like to show you. 
Please, okay, uh, Wolfram, you Thank can... you, Mikhail. So we will continue here by the yeah. time you reach it there. Yeah, so, so definitely the temperatures are, are in fact much, much higher yeah. because in the, in the sun, you still have atoms and you have nuclei which are intact. But in the very early parts of the universe, I mean, we are talking about a tiny fraction of a second after the beginning of the universe. The temperatures were so high that neither atoms uh, nor protons existed. All the elementary particles we are talking about where, as uh, Akshana said, uh, uh, in a kind of soup, uh, dissolved in a soup, and none of the other structures like atoms or nuclei existed at that, that time, because exactly because the temperature was much, much higher than even in the sun. Thank you, Wolfgang. Let's go to the next question. Uh, there is no, well, oh, there is there one is one. huge number of questions. No, in, 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 there is one in the oh, Q&A. Yeah. If we can find yeah. and know the ultimate particle of matter, mm -hmm. or what the universe is made of, then will it be possible for us to create artificial material objects and artificial universes of varying sizes or as desired? A very good question. We don't know. Well, so am, I, am I again on uh, on air? Yes, Michael, we see you. Uh, we got we we are getting questions. Um, okay, well, but, let me. Let, uh, you can answer the question in a minute when I, when we, when you go down because I want would yeah, like to that's emphasize. A, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. Yeah, I, I would like to emphasize one thing uh, here. You see a collage. Actually, here we we made. You you may read CMS, but uh, this is this is it shows eight hundred people, eight hundred portraits of uh, my colleagues. I would like, and this shows a little bit the diversity of people um, we needed to create the uh, women, men, professors, students, uh, all type of people. Here's even me here. Yeah. Uh, and one thing, what 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 is uh, what is what I want to emphasize here is, um, uh, we have within 25 years building CMS, we had. 11 more than 11,000 people participating so you need a very high number of very creative and enthusiastic people to uh, to work on this so this is something and they come cms come uh, is a collaboration in 50 different countries and more than 200 university institutes so this should be an invitation to you to join uh, institutions in bhutan bhutan who work with a CERN, and then you may join uh, our our experiments, our endeavors, scientific endeavors here. It's collaboration and networking is really crucial for everybody. And uh, I would like to invite you to, to join and use it. Um, maybe you can have a, a quick look. This is where we go now. There's a video where you show how the CMS, the co uh, compact moon solenoid is somehow uh, shift it together because if you want to open if you want to work in between this uh, you need to open it up if you go down you see it's more closed and we can look we can uh, watch a part of it but um, to, to work in this you have to uh, open up so now to enter will I have to go down and this is very secured area because is radiation environment Safety is, is the safety first. And this is a dosimeter um, measuring radiation if I get uh, in contact with radiation. So, uh, and there's a, uh, a, a door which controls uh, biometric scan. Okay, so we can take a question in the meantime. Uh, are we on? Yes, yes, we are on. Okay. So I, I propose to start with this one with from this the one? chat. Okay, there's a so, question. Uh, from hi, we have a question. Well, there was the question about the universe. Yeah, and how the, to build the Oh, yeah. Well, we I, want to that, yeah. well, I would say that creating new universes is, might be a little bit ambitious goal. Uh, but if we understand uh, other types of uh, elementary particles, we can understand uh, uh, states of matter, which are maybe not usual in our direct environment. And you know, in, the uni in our universe, there are locations where uh, matter is in a very special state, like in neutron stars and, and close to black holes and so on. And so if we understand how particles and even particles which are not familiar in our environment uh, interact and, and, and behave, 
then they can get an idea of how this behaves in other parts of the universe. Right, and uh, if you remember Wolfgang, we, we have made antimatter at CERN in the 1995, and it took a huge amount of effort to make, I think, a micro, uh, or microgram or something like that, and a lot of money. I think it's the, it's the most expensive material on the planet. First of all, many orders of magnets many orders more expensive than gold, for yeah, example. More, many orders of uh, expensive than gold. So creating matter or creating, uh, you know, particles is, uh, of course, very, very difficult. So creating universes is something completely different. Let's take one more question. Yeah, uh, so actually, that is, that is one question concerning to this mm -hmm. previous. Is there any theory which could better explain the formation of universe or CERN is still sticking to Big Bang? <laughs> well, well, I uh, let's say we are still with what, we are again. I hear again, so with what we are doing here, we are still a kind of a billionth of a second away from the Big Bang. So uh, what we are doing here is is still very, very, it's very, very close to the Big Bang, but we are not yet talking directly about the Big Bang. So this is uh, rather a domain which uh, physicists, I mean, who are called cosmologists, uh, are dealing with and making theories of. Correct. So we are very close, but we are not directly talking yeah. about the Big yeah. Bang. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, Big Bang is the 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 most uh, evidence supported uh, up to now, uh, up to now uh, theory. But of course, we are open. Yeah, yeah. So if we find anything that is Correct. outside of this, right. we are not sticking on on. Mm. on on a theory. Uh, one more, one more question I would propose is, is from here before yeah. it runs away. Yeah. Uh, can you always control the outcome of the collisions that take place at the LHC? Mm -hmm. Won't there be a risk of creating a mm -hmm. black hole or mm -hmm. similar phenomena? Thank you for the question. It's coming from uh, uh, CS. Yes. So the question is about uh, how to control what happens in the collisions. Not really. However, we do understand what happens in the collisions by studying all the well, probabilities. Well, first, yes. Prob probabilities of what yeah. would happen in, the, in these collisions because we have studied the theories and various theories about the standard model and about the interactions, strong interactions yeah. between the hadrons and uh, all what is uh, coming out from the collisions is expected. All the, the various uh, cross sections are known and that uh, of course surprises will be there and that's what we are waiting for. But we have very well uh, confirmed the standard model and we have studied the particles that are coming out from these collisions to a degree yeah. which really support the standard model. Right. Okay, um, um, maybe, moment, maybe Michael. Just, Michael, just, one just a single moment. One, one, okay, more, good. Uh, one more thing that we are, of course, we are creating, we are the first ones creating this kind of collisions artificially yes. human-made. Important. But one should also say that very rarely, but sometimes these collisions also happen in the universe because in the universe we have particles which have been accelerated by natural processes exactly. to energies which are similar yeah. to what we are doing here right. or even higher. Yeah. And if such a catastrophic thing like a black hole would have happened, we would have seen the traces of this happening exactly. in the universe. Exactly. And also during the, the more than four billion years yes. while the, the Earth is here, right. these very energetic collisions to the upper atmosphere did happen. Absolutely. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, but let's let's give back the, the voice to Michael. Right. He would yes. like to show something very, very interesting. Yes. So I'm I'm here. We I uh, went down with Noemi now uh, to uh, a little uh, and the one floor above the beam pipe of LHC. So we are very close to the uh, to the um, experimental cavern. And I'm here just to explain you where we are. So we have because we have two caverns 100 meters below ground and you see this is the, um, the electronic cavern, the service cavern, and the experimental cavern. So this experimental cavern hosts the experiment, as you can see here. And we went down here, the shaft, and we are now here. And uh, they, these two caverns somehow are separated. We need uh, these two uh, volumes down there because the, during the collisions in, in the experimental cavern, we have very harsh radiation environment due to the collisions. 
So there's a high uh, radiation in there. You don't want to expose your electronic and no, neither your, your body. And the other thing is, Ashana and Wolfgang mentioned it already, to co uh, we collide uh, the proton-proton and then we create for a short moment new matter, uh, which decays immediately in many uh, uh, particles. And we have to measure these particles. And uh, to measure them and to, to identify them, we need a magnetic field in the experiment to deviate them, to make them, to make understand, well, this is a positive particle, this is a negative particle. To the charge by the curvature, you can uh, identify uh, the momentum of the particle. So you, you need the magnetic field. And also a magnetic field is not, is not very good for the electronic either, that it works correctly. That's why we have two caverns. Um, and we are now in this cavern and we go now one floor down I show you some electronic wrecks, and then we go via a tunnel to the experimental cover. Okay, follow me. We go downstairs now. You may answer now questions while uh, we are uh, you you follow me. There was a question about what is that black heart sign. Oh I yeah, think I, you can explain this. Yes, exactly. So uh, you saw this sign when uh, Michael entered the the zone. Uh, this is in conjunction with the, the fact that we are using one of the strongest magnets uh, of, of its class. Right. Uh, uh, we have a very gigantic 3.8 Tesla magnet. This is more than 100,000 times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. And even the stray field is strong enough <clears throat> to interfere with the uh, electric electronic implants Right. of people so this sign is an international sign for uh, those people who, who are having uh, uh, these kind of implants not only the pacemakers but as well as insulin pumps for example right. that they should be very well they, they should stay away yes. indeed. okay the next question we can take is creations of particles in cms is biggest achievements in the field of technology. So my question is, can CMS detect cosmic radiation in the universe? Welcome. Yeah, in fact, we are, uh, the experiment is uh, well, it's built to detect the products of the proton protocol collision with the accelerator. But in fact, we have also these particles coming down from cosmic rays. Well, and even it's, now. It's even now here and even 100 meters underground. Even in Bhutan. Still, <laughs> and even in Bhutan, yes. we still have uh, these particles coming down. And the detector is also sensitive to these particles. So we also see traces from particles coming from above going through the experiment. Thank you, Wolfgang. Okay, uh, this one? Let's see. When our um, universe was created from Big Bang, equal amount of matter and antimatter were, yes. were released after the Big Bang. Very good. But currently, antimatter has disappeared. Yeah. Has the particle accelerator answered the disappearance of the antimatter? It's a very good question from Kaden. Moitan, Maybe, Ashana, maybe may I uh, quickly interrupt you before I walk over and you can continue? Okay. I just want to okay. show you. I okay. would like just to show you some, uh, now I'm really in the, at the heart of CMS, at the electronic heart. So okay. there you see some electronic uh, wrecks um, uh, uh, installed. There were many, many wrecks here uh, of various electronic. And you could see already one thing, you see the light, the yellow and the light uh, uh, blue. These are fibers where the signal is tra uh, transported. Uh, and then you have uh, copper for the lower slow control and for the power. Uh, we we will uh, show you um, there's and one thing what what I would like to uh, uh, tell you as well because you as as we have two caverns uh, most of the uh, so you have the signals created in the experiment and the electronic most of the electronic sitting here. The advantage is of course uh, even if the electronic breaks you can while you take data you can come down and uh, replace uh, uh, these uh, electronic boards and you do not have to stop your experiment the running uh, experiment um but one one uh, you need to know that uh, this the, the the distance the physical distance between these electronic boards and the signal and the, and the creating uh, the uh, sensor at the, the center of the of the experiment is around in the mean is 120 meters 
So the signal created in the center of the detector, <laughs> then processed here, travels 120 meters. The signal goes with the speed of light. Speed of light is 300,000 kilometers per second. You can, and we have, we create collisions, so signals each 25 nanoseconds. You can easily calculate how many signals are already in the, um, in the, in the, in the, in the fiber between the, uh, the experiment, the sensors and the, and, and the electronic here before they get processed. So it's, there are waves of information coming from this big camera to this control, to this uh, uh, electronic here, and then again, again processed. Maybe uh, Wolfgang and uh, Shana may also uh, comment a little bit on the trigger and the data volume. So while I'm going through the, through, through the electronic uh, uh, wrecks, Please. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Maybe first we, we address the, the question of the antimatter. Where has it disappeared? Have we explained? Yes. Yeah, so this is, this is in fact one of the big mysteries of our discipline at the moment is we, uh, yes, we believe that matter and antimatter will, were produced at the same levels at the beginning of the universe. Mm -hmm. And uh, fortunately, there is a difference, obviously the small difference, yeah. which made that we are, in fact, we are made from a little bit of extra matter which uh, which remained and all the rest of the matter and antimatter essentially annihilated to energy and in fact you have some explanations what could explain this this little bit of difference how matter and antimatter behaves but uh, in fact this is not sufficient and this is one of the big questions we are trying to answer so we are trying to compare different matter and antimatter particles and we are trying to find out in which way they behave differently, so right. which could explain that from a state of equal parts of matter and antimatter, how we arrived at this uh, asymmetry we have now. Yeah, so we have a dedicated experiment for that, and that's called LHCB, which is looking at this uh, this question. Uh, so maybe you want to say a couple of things about the trigger and the data. Yeah, value. so you have to. Uh, to understand that in the, in the accelerator, the, uh, the protons are organized in little bunches and they meet essentially at the rate of 40 million times per second. So this creates an enormous amount of data. So this detector, this is a, like a big camera, is taking a kind of a, mega, a megabyte picture 40 million times per second. And then, but this is too much to, uh, to analyze or to store. And it's also most of it uh, processes which we already know and which we are not really interested anymore in. We have to reduce this data volume and there we have two stages. One stage is uh, happening in the electronics uh, Michael just showed, which is reducing from 40 million per second to about 100,000 per second. And then here at the surface, we have a big computing farm which reduces it from 100,000 per second to about 1,000 per second. And these are finally, these 1,000 per second are the data which are then you used by the physicists to analyze and the processes. But this is still um, one CD per second. So, yes. so the data rate is um, high. Well, well, Wolfgang, Wolfgang uh, just one, just uh, uh, now I'm here uh, about to enter in the uh, experimental cavern. And now uh, you, see, you see here, uh, I, it looks like I'm in the tunnel of LHC. Uh, what you see here is actually, um, the, you see the dipole magnets, and uh, they go all the way. Uh, it's 27 kilometers around. So, and we are very close now, within uh, we to the LHC tunnel because you have the the circular accelerator ring, and then you have the uh, caverns where they are hosting the uh, the, uh, the experiments. So. Let's, let's go further. Yeah. You see the picture on the screen? That no, no, not yet. Not I'm, yet. I'm, I'm preparing for prepared. the answer of one. Okay. Uh, let's how go, how many particles are detected? Let's go to this question. Uh, solution of no, this was this the, the smallest yeah. particle. Yeah. I want to know what are the smallest particles. Particles are there partless, partless parts. parts. Yes, that's indeed. a very good question. Indeed, very good question. 
So yeah, uh, the smallest particles up to now we know are the leptons and the quarks. They are the building blocks of matter. However, the partless particles are like the gluons, which actually hold the, the, uh, the quarks together. So something called quark confinement, so mm -hmm. that they do not fly away. And because of the strong force, they will always remain together inside this bag of... Uh, it was massless particles? Uh, no, partless no, particles. So, so, partless. So actually, so structure. at this moment, what we think are, are these particles of the, yeah. the standard model, right. but we don't know if there is any other yeah. extra layer. Mm -hmm. This is also a question that we are trying to answer. Right. In fact, the, the accelerator with these energies acts, as was already said, like a giant microscope. Exactly. And the detail we can resolve with this microscope is uh, related to the energy yeah. we have. So with the energy we have in these collisions, essentially, we can see a spatial distance of a certain amount. Correct. And the higher we go in the energy, the, the, the closer we would be able to look at. That's right, yeah. Okay. So we are here downstairs now. Yeah, yeah, very good. Uh, welcome to CMS. This is one of the most beautiful uh, science experiments that you can think of. It's so beautiful. So that's why we call it the princess of science. So welcome to the princess of science. And what you see in the background here is where uh, I showed you the tunnel of LHC, where in the, in the very center, there's a LHC beam pipe coming from the tunnel, which is uh, the backside in here behind this orange absor uh, uh, absorber. Then there's just the beam pipe, <coughs> the vacuum beam pipe coming out where the protons are in there, and they enter in, 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 in CMS. And then the other side, they exit. So they, they come from both sides, cross in, in, in the center of CMS. And when they cross, some of the particles collide. <clears throat> the beam structure, so you, uh, it's the LHC beam, is not a continuous beam. These are uh, bunches, we call them, groups of proton who circulate. And so these groups of proton, the 100 billion protons in each of these bunches, and they travel here. And if they cross through each other at the very center of the experiment, you have around 10 to 60 who collide simultaneously and then create the matter decay <coughs> and uh, make, make the uh, signals in uh, the, uh, the sensors. So what we do now is uh, we'll, we'll go downstairs and I give you a view from the princess of science from different perspectives. Well, come follow me. Let me just take the word. Um, there is a question uh, concerning safety. What are the risks and health related issues to people <coughs> if a worker doesn't take the safety measures? Well, actually this environment, as you see, it's an industrial environment uh, with its with, 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 with the characteristic uh, uh, safety issues for a industrial environment. So people might fall, people might, uh, might bump into things. This might happen. Of course, we, we all train, we train all people who go on the ground in order to understand the risks and, uh, and uh, behave accordingly. As you might see from Michael, uh, he is uh, wearing safety helmet, safety shoes. <laughs> shoes are down, no, I mean, uh, safety shoes. We all have to, to take them. On, as an extra, yes, exactly. This is what we have to talk about. Uh, as, as an extra to the industrial environment, this is a radiation environment as well, at least legally. At this time when Michael is in, the radiation is extremely low, but we are all uh, obliged to use dosimeters. Michael, could you please show the dosimeter? Yeah, dosimeters, and uh, uh, these dosimeters are regularly read out. Actually, just in order to tell that uh, we are not more exposed 
we uh, we are under the same regulations as the normal population of the the four millisievert per year, and we never exceed it. We at least measure it. Yes. Uh, and so, that was another blue box in Michael's neck. Let me just just uh, just very tell, tell it very briefly. Mm -hmm. This is COVID. These are proximeters. We we are all obliged to use them. And in case of an infection, we can automatically detect who was in connection with whom. Okay, Michal. Okay. Okay. Yes, uh, I, now I would like to um, uh, show you where, where, where I am now. I'm at the, the bottom of the cavern, where uh, and the bottom of CMS. So, and if, if we now look up, if, uh, if Noemi goes a little bit to the side and then makes us a, uh, a move to the, you, you see where we come from. <clears throat> because there you see the, uh, the light on the, at the end of this uh, shaft is the surface. This is, this is where, we, that we, where we are, uh, where um, uh, Sultan, Ajana, uh, and uh, Wolfgang are right now. And uh, this is uh, the shaft is where we uh, lowered this heavy equipment is, is huge uh, pieces because we 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 assembled big parts of the of equipment on the surface hole and then lowered them here and here if you uh, if you if, if you go down here as I said and I showed you a little video how to open it and uh, and you have to understand these big discs we will uh, show you from the side um, they are discs they are up to 1,200 tons heavy weight. And how do you move this? And they are, they are preparing just to reopen the experiment here. The equipment is already ready. <coughs> and here you see um, uh, this, this uh, orange piece. This is one of the feeds with the uh, air pads. And the air pads is like uh, techn technology like hovercraft. You put high pressured air you lift it. You lift it up a few millimeters, and then on the side, you see metal cables, which are then, once it's lifted up a few millimeters, then it will pull it out, and will pull it to the side to uh, open it up to have access in between the discs. Uh, Noemi is showing you the hydraulic. Uh, pump where uh, where you wait to pull the whole thing and then for here from the side I show you the segments we have 11 segments 11 huge discs you can we can take apart with the uh, with the with the sensors hosting the sensors holding the sensors as alarm. That's a normal thing. So Over. here you see one of my colleagues. Merci. Noemi, Noemi. Yeah, there you see the, this, the, the slices. And this one here, uh, there's a distance. So this is, this is one slice. You, you, you can uh, you can pull back and then you would have access to in, in between on, on either side of the uh, of the detect of the sensors and then you can, can shift the next one uh, what would you see here my colleague is working on the cabling but there are many ca uh, cabling and pipes cooling pipes all different kinds of liquids and one here we're in a very center part. This is as well. This is one sector here where this can be shifted. The only sector which is not uh, moved anymore is the very center part. This is always center on and on either side. You can move the disc to the side to be to have access in between uh, to. Uh, manipulate some equipment and and now there you can see 
we shifted a uh, uh, few, few elements to the side. And this is the most impressive view because you see now in the heart of CMS uh, when it's open. <coughs> <coughs> And you can immediately see, again, the beam pipe in the center sticking out and sticking in the very center part. Um, actually, this, this here, this is the magnet. This is seven meters in and, and diameter and 13 meters long. As Soitan mentioned, this is the strongest magnet, biggest and strongest magnet worldwide right now. It's also using the same technology like the LHC magnets, it's superconductive magnets. Wolfgang may uh, explain you a little bit later what is superconductivity. And then you see one another, uh, apart from of the beauty, there's another thing what I'd like, like you to, to, to have a look, uh, because here you see these are in here, we are talking about the barrel part. Barrel means you have the orientation of the, the sensors vis-a-vis -vis the beam pipe and the collision point. And here, what you see here, the red parts are the iron, is, are the iron structure, <coughs> which holds the silver boxes. The boxes are the sensors. So, and this iron structure is used for on one side to hold the, the, the sensors, but uh, second uh, top, uh, se se second <clears throat> part, what is, uh, is it's, it's used as a return yoke for the magnetic field. So then you squeeze in the magnetic field to where you need it to have a strong magnetic field made by the, by the magnet. And if you then, Go to the forward part. If uh, if uh, Noemi comes here and shows you the other side of the, the other this, <coughs> you see that the sensors, the big chambers, measuring sensors, are somehow trapezoid shaped. And this is not because there are so many Italian uh, teams working on and they like pizza. No, it's about using the space and the surface. An optimum. So, and there you can see the the sensors uh, are very close to each other. Then below they are overlap, but you do not miss any particle information created at the very center. So, once again, in this in the imperial part, you have the the beam the beam pipe, and you have the chambers like this, and the uh, two two extremes on the end cap on either side, you, sw you, uh, you switch the chambers like this. So you have barrel and end cap. And then you have, of course, many different uh, sensors dif dif uh, taking different uh, tasks. You have in the very center, a silicon pixel and a silicon um, strip detectors, a very high granularity silicon detector to make very precise measurement of uh, the particle tracks uh, around the collision point. And then you have two layers of um, uh, energy measurement of we call colorimeters. Okay, the hadronic colorimeter and the, um, and the Fermont, uh, the, the um, colorimeter. So in this, um, you, uh, you see here, if you if you if you look up, there's a forward um, in here. These there are the there are the uh, in here. These these are the uh, color meter parts, and from the forward part. And this big stamp here, uh, as you could see, it fits very precisely in in this hole there to close. The, the experiment. Um, yes, and there, uh, there is the, the, something I'd like to show you because uh, you may, you may know. Well, we, 
you may know a little this this is a, a magnetic these are um met, metal rings and there i i'd like to show you about the magnetic field yes actually the big magnet is off what you see here is the remnant field yes. yeah Oops. exactly so the magnet has magnetized the metal here and so it keeps a, a little bit a of little bit of a permanent yeah. so when he spoke about uh, safety shoes mm -hmm. you know they yes. also have to be non magnetic otherwise you'll be up there on the disc you know yeah <laughs> so I, I, I knew about I remember, the boss who stick I remember we were there together probably <laughs> when we had to replace the the toe here you know it yeah. has to be non magnetic oh, it's steel it's a steel yeah. toe usually <laughs> So it's it's quite interesting to learn all these things as we go along, and uh, of course we have to take all the precautions when we are designing the detectors, so that inside the the detectors themselves and the sensitive materials, we do not have uh, magnetic materials, right? Yeah. Voila. So I, uh, Michael, are you sure for your yes. detectors? For the detectors, I think uh, you made a very good uh, uh, <clears throat> explanations. I think we might want to show more about the muon system also because yes. that's important. Can you show that, please? So maybe maybe we go we uh, we go a little move a little bit back and we show the muon system. So, so as because, Michael said, well, that's that the center muon system part. over there. I know, well. I know, but he, <laughs> he didn't mention. So the very center, the heart of CMS, as Michael has shown, consists of the silicon and pixel detectors, like Michael said also. And those detectors, as you can imagine, when a collision is taking place, huge number of particles are coming out from the same place. So close to the collision, they are very concentrated. And as you go further, do you see your screen? No, no, not yet. Not but yet. I would like to show them this. Show them the screen. Yeah, that's what you have to show. Yeah. So um, yes, now he is at the muon uh, muon system and the very <clears> large. Large, can you show the a man here? Yeah. yeah so exactly. on your screen you see a person, right? And the size of the detector is really something like you know uh, 50 meters by 20 uh, by 10 meters. Uh, yeah, it's it's a four-story building. It's a four-story building, and it's very dense. You know, it's like a cylindrical onion of that size, which if you cut into slices, every cell is a sensitive cell, <coughs> and with a different characteristics because the particles that are coming out from the center they all have different characteristics and we need to That's measure them yeah, we, seen on this we need picture. to be able to yeah, catch this, them this is one slice, slice of the yeah. if, if we could of course we would mm -hmm. use ideally use one detector to measure everything we want right but we don't have one detector which can measure do all the things we want to right, know right. so we we use different layers yeah. of it. May I have a, a, a just a remark here? Please. So usually what I used to tell the visitors that there were Nobel Prizes awarded for the discovery of Z, W, Higgs recently, right. but we cannot see these particles uh, directly. They live for so short, actually for characteristically minus uh, 10, to the, 10, to, 10 to minus 20th uh, second that they cannot <laughs> even uh, travel the distance of a proton diameter. Yes. So they decay much before they would exit from the vacuum pipe and reach the detector. Mm -hmm. But right. what we can see are the decay particles. And what we have to measure, the direction of the flight of the decay particle, the energy, the momentum, what it takes away, and also the, the flavor exactly. of the particle. And, <clears throat> and this cannot be made by one monolithic detector. Right. Uh, in addition, like, like my colleague said, uh, Zoltan said about the, the Z particles, the W particles and the Nobel Prizes, even Nobel Prizes have been given for detectors that oh, have yes. been built mm -hmm. that are able to see these particles because without the tools, you don't do the physics. So it's a really uh, you know, a complementary uh, system where you know, theoretical physicists create the theories and they hypothesize experimentalists try to build the tools to measure and experimentally verify those theories and then we can take them forward and one more point is the accelerator absolutely so the for the w's and z's right the nobel prize was shared between 
Carlo Rubia, the yes, physicist who, who, who found these particles, and Simon van der Mer, who yes. made the, the who accelerator. Made the accelerator possible, yes, indeed, yeah. And George Sharp, uh, who did the multi-wire chamber. And, and for fast detectors. Yes, exactly. Oh, uh, maybe, uh, let me, let me uh, uh, make another comment on the aesthetic of this ex uh, uh, ex of CMS, but in, in of the experiment in, in general, because as you can imagine, as uh, Jana already explained, how we measure uh, the decay particles, um, you, you, and the size, this pure size, CMS is 20 meters in diameter uh, and 25 meter long, so it's just like a huge a building with super, super, so it's a, a, a gigantic uh, dimension with super, super uh, microscopic resolution. And um, so no space is wasted. If you look closely, all the cables are put one to each other, very, very close, all pipes. And there's no, no millimeter. And we have to know where all these cables are because measuring uh, the particles, if they traverse matter, you deviate, you disturb the measurement. So that means you have to understand very clearly where your material is. And then the founding fathers, the speciality of CMS is, is of course that the founding fathers, when they designed the detector, they decided to make, to have a certain color code. <clears throat> you, could, you could color everything in, in blue. And then you have metal and blue, Atlas is, uh, they use always the same color, they have Atlas blue. So you have a also very beautiful experiment with blue and metal. However, CMS, they, they decided to have different uh, color for different functionality, which is of course a clever thing because then you see immediately, um, so what is, uh, what, what kind of um, object you're looking at? As I already said, the red part is iron. The yolk, the uh, holding structure of the centers. Then you have the green, this, as you can see here, and all around. These are the uh, support structures <clears throat> holding the support. Then you have uh, yellow are the lifting structures. Orange are the are the feet. Then. Uh, if you show around uh, the other side, there's black. This is a carbon structure. And this is a carbon structure, which is very familiar to Sultan and Noemi because it's their, their technological uh, baby. Because this carbon structure measures in very Back precise the way the, uh, the displacement of the, of the chambers. Because you have to know where your, your measuring device is. And you, can, you, you, know, you may know that material is expanding and shrinking with temperature. One, two degrees change will end up in a big shift if you measure in micrometer scale. That means you have to, uh, you have to measure very clearly and monitor how your measuring, de uh, measuring devices, where they are, that you then call, can also identify the, the, in very high precision. No, if, I, if I may, uh, may make a, a remark, if I'm, uh, as I am, as I was addressed, um, if you look at the structure, this is a ring-like structure, the, the this and this wheel, and you can imagine that due to the due to the gravity, this sags a little bit. Right. And you can also imagine that when we turn on this gigantic magnet, it symmetrizes. So on the side, we have even a millimeter of a movement which is much, much bigger than the resolution of the detector itself. So we definitely need to, to know it. Yeah, yeah so and then, there's, a, there's, another, there's another thing which is also interesting to know, where if we close the experiment um, and then we switch on the magnetic field, the whole detector is squeezed by another 10 centimeter. That's so strong, the magnetic field, that it just puts everything again, stronger together. So now I would, I would suggest you should, we have a look from the other side before we go up with the lift again to the surface. Come on, no, but you are the... Hello. 
Michael, can I just yes. make a comment here? So yeah. yes, please. Which is the, your next position coming up? I think yes. you can come up. Uh, yeah. so yes, we, 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 exactly. We have the last views of the open detector. Yes. Then we enter uh, in the lift and we come up. Okay. Very good. So we'll take a couple of questions in this time. Yes. Okay. Here, and uh, one, then... one, yes, last, last view here. You see, SLR. this is uh, this is one of uh, the support uh, pillar from the 1,200 ton uh, wheel with the electromagnetic and the hydronic color meter, forward color meter. So you see, you see the, and the, the pure size, uh, how uh, the, the engineering has to be precise to, to, uh, to, to keep this all together. Okay, so from this side, uh, we good. say bye-bye, bye-bye from the, uh, the princess of science, and we come yeah. up to have a discussion yes. with you. Very good. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. I hope you all had a wonderful time downstairs along with no. us. <laughs> it has uh, it has been a place where we have been working uh, for the last nearly 25 years and uh, still you know every day is as exciting as it can be we learn new things we repair things we upgrade we continuously keep UGC going it, it is an emotional question it as is, well it so. is yeah so uh, many of you are asking uh, questions about uh, uh, let's take one of your questions from Gele Pu HSS Bhutan. How can we apply the, uh, the CERN summer internship exchange program and what are the criteria? So the first thing you want to type on your browser is careers.cern. Okay, you can write it there also. Mm -hmm. And then you go to students. When you look for students, there are different kinds of students. For summer, you need to have completed three years of university. And UGC then you will be able to apply. And the program is just been opened, which means that until January 31st, you can apply for the summer student internships. That's a good point. Uh, uh, no, uh, uh, Ajana, maybe yes? you mentioned this is not just for physics students. This is for all engineering and, and yeah. physics. Yeah, if, thank you, Michael. Yes, indeed. So when you will go to that website, you will see that uh, that the, the program is for all kinds of disciplines. So that is the physics, the engineering, which is applied physics and computing. There's also a program called Open Lab, where you, you apply for working on the IT side. So you'll see a lot of these things and perhaps uh, you you uh, please do not forget to note the, the original SLR. website that is careers.cern okay that's the answer for the internship question yep uh, any other questions let's see uh, maybe maybe there's another thing what i would like to emphasize here uh, uh, how to how to join cern uh, ad uh, adventure is also to, to join to join uh, the local institutions who work who collaborate with CERN. So okay, uh, let let me answer this, Michael. Thank you, because I don't know you may be cut in the lift. So not on time. not on the way up. Not on the way up. Only on the way down. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> so uh, you <laughs> watch the meters go up now from hundred meters below. Now we are going to come up. Uh, Michael is going to come up with his crew but with Noemi. Just for just for sake of yeah security or safety yeah <laughs> yes very good so we can see what's going on yes, yes. so uh the, what was he saying yeah about the the joining of so let me add maybe my personal comments about uh, working together because that's the goal in the end mm -hmm. that students teachers uh, researchers faculty uh, the STEM education has to be reinforced. That is the main goal, I, as I have understood from Bhutan. And in India, a lot of efforts are also going on. So a good thing would be, because we are neighbors and because we have very good relationships and we work together, there are programs that have been um, curated by the Swiss Embassy in India UGC because it looks after India and Bhutan. Mm -hmm. And there are programs which are linked with CERN also. So let us maybe try to sit around the same table and try to see what are the best ways forward. I think the student uh, is the first point of entry. That's very good. And apart from that, uh, we can have several programs uh, where 
Bhutanese students can join, like Michael was saying, the efforts already Bhutanese ongoing in Kolkata, well. in India, or in New Delhi, or in Mumbai. We have many collaborators, leading physicists in India also who are working inside CMS. And they can uh, be mentoring and starting up uh, the institutions in, in Bhutan. So I but think uh, this discussion- Anyway, one should say that, uh, I mean, the majority of the people working on CMS are in fact working for institutions outside CERN. Yes. So for example, I am working for the Austrian Academy of Sciences. Right. I happen to be located here, Right. but the, the rest of the team essentially is in Vienna most of the time. Yes. And they are only well, communicating electronically and they're coming Absolutely. to CERN from time to time. Yeah. And this is true for uh, well the 200 other institutions which are part of CMS. Right. So most of the people are working from abroad and they are back home. But then we have to create the infrastructure uh -huh. and the support system, really. So our team is back. Michael and Noemi, we are here. She doesn't like to show herself. Come here. Well, she has many other things Everyone to do. Everyone has to say thank you to you. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. Thank well, you. Let me take a, a last picture. Please, yes. Yeah. Take a nice picture. Where should we look? Yes. Tell us where are we so, supposed to be? On the screen. On the screen. Yeah. On the screen. On the screen. Yeah. It was Zoltan is not there. Yeah, I'm, I'm usually I used to do this. <laughs> hey, please take it again. Yeah. One yes, one from the background. Yeah. Please. So it was it was our pleasure to, to yes. have a Absolutely. visit with you. Thanks for visiting us. And yeah. let's hope that. This is not the last one. So exactly, this is not the yes. last one. And let's yeah. hope that physically we will meet here as well. Uh, the, uh, teacher, uh, the teacher uh, training is scheduled in Bhutan, by the way, as you know, in April. But it, uh, given uh, COVID permitting, we might have it, uh, you know, we'll see how we do it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Michael and Tim, uh, can you hear us? Yes, yes we hear you. Yeah. Uh, we have a few questions from the floor. Uh, in this hall, yeah. uh, take one or two more questions. Yes, please. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Phyllis Kurongo, and uh, I'm really glad to be part yeah. of. A little this. bit louder. I think this we can out. listen. Yeah, go ahead. Please. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Sanofi and I'm really very much pleased to be joining this session. And I have one question, uh, that is, uh, how can CMS possibly enhance or advance humanity's knowledge on ba basic laws or origin of the universe? Basic laws of the universe. Okay, so uh, thank you for your question. And uh, I really appreciate to see also a number of women there. So thank you for being really advanced in this way. So um, all what we are trying to do here is to do research to try to answer questions about the universe. Some of the questions that were mentioned already, they were about the asymmetry between matter and antimatter, because you know, at the time of the Big Bang, they should have been equal, but they are not because we exist. So these are questions which we are trying to answer. The origin, uh, how mass was given to particles, why they are all different, and so on. So there are many, many different questions uh, that are still open as well. Higgs was found in 2012, but there are many other questions that are open. So yes, we are looking at many mysteries of the universe and trying to study different kinds of particles, their behaviors, the interactions and so on. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question. One more question. Question. Last question, yes. Yep. Anyone, last question? <laughs> okay, um, good afternoon yes. from us and good morning over there. So uh, dark matter makes up 90% of what's in the universe. So we were wondering, is it possible to actually put some of that matter and that energy to use? Because it's so much untouched resource. So if it's possible... <laughs> <laughs> Very good question, and we are all looking together for this answer, right? Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> because if not we yet. find a candidate of dark matter in CMS, 
I think all of us here will be dancing yeah. and you know running to exactly. Sweden. <laughs> the, the fact, the, let's see. The first step would be to understand exactly what dark matter is. What and it this is, is the, yeah. This yeah, is the yeah. first problem because at, at the moment yeah. we, see, we know that it's, it's there, exactly. but we don't understand what it is. But right, this right. is a very good question because there was an analogy in the human history so far. If you think back, the dancing paper parts led you to the electricity. Right, right, right. Uh, and, and nobody thought that from this, my mobile telephone will, will, will grow out. Exactly. Uh, so we should we should stay open for all these things. And, Absolutely. and, and that's why we, we also have to understand these mysteries. Yeah. So please uh, tell us your name, who asked the last question. Um, my name is Sanam Chani. Can you write it for me? Sanam, Sanam yeah. Thank you, Sanam. Fantastic question. And we, we will address it when you come here and we are going to talk to you about it. Exactly. exactly. Okay. So I think we can. Try. Okay. Yes. Yeah. You, you make oh, okay. You can give your final remarks. Yeah. It's on, right? Yes. 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 Okay. So since I've been asked to close in our national language, uh, I will try. La. La so, la, the tari, uh, Lubi the tele look to the soak or look the kagi, tele go pin the soak, aragi, cutelator in a chamotomidi in this a pleasure atop the bone, no video, or you that in a cheek, could have geeks, I give cutelay berura, the Nabulu charo cateta, shunigi, chashunigi, um, Kelly New Salamivella. So maybe just to uh, wrap up in English, if you all need any uh, further such virtual visits or if you all need assistance from our embassy or the missions office, please feel free to contact la, the Royal STEM office as well as the education ministry has our details of the mission of uh, Bhutan in Geneva. La. So please feel free to contact us. We will be happy to facilitate. I'm sure the team here would be happy to facilitate further such visits by the Bhutanese students. And today from the questions that I saw that uh, many students and also the schools have asked, I could already, already see that there's so much of interest among the students and we do hope that this is one of the very first beginning and we look forward to many more such visits and i would like to thank the minister of education the royal stem office and also all the students for participating and of course i would really like to thank the team here led by michael and as well as sultan dr archana and wolfgang and noami for making this visit a huge success thank you so much and tashi delela Thank you, Thank you, Dr. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. See you next time. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. I don't know if you have any.